Hey, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. As we get started today on this podcast, I want you to close your eyes for a moment, unless you're driving. Don't do it if you're driving. But just reflect on your life and how you have set up the areas of your life, anywhere from personal relationships to your professional work life to your home life. Just look at some of the major areas of your life. And I want you to pay attention today of the things you've set up in your life to make yourself comfortable, all the comforts you've put into your life. Like as one example could be a very simple thing, heating or air conditioning in your house or apartment or the place you live helps you be, be comfortable in that space, all the way up to maybe more complex things, how you engage with people, more esoteric things, less tangible like air conditioning units in the heat of the summer, and more how you engage with people. Maybe you do most of your correspondence through email because you don't like to talk on the phone. So look at all the areas of your life and identify the things you do to stay inside your comfort zone. As we reflect on that, I just want to point out that when we stay in our comfort zone, we typically avoid doing hard things that will move our life forward. It's been my experience, and probably yours too, Antonia, that when we confront difficult things head on and we tackle challenges in our life, not only do we see results from those things, I mean, you're actually doing something in your life, you're affecting changes, but you also prove to yourself there's a self-esteem that comes from doing hard things and pushing through your comfort zone to the other side. There's a, a call that we have here at Personality Hacker, a, a, a compelling drive that we have to bring to you as a listener to this podcast, practical advice and how-tos in your life. And I was looking over my bookshelf recently in the past week or two, and I pulled off a book that I've had for years called The Tools. And I started flipping through it. And I remember using this book called The Tools. It's by Phil Stutz, S-T-U-T-Z, and Barry Michaels, M-I-C-H-E-L-S. It's called The Tools. I've used this book in my life to see changes happen for the positive. When I was going through a really, really tough time with my ex-wife and child custody issues, I had used some of the tools in this book to get through some of those difficult experiences. And so the exercise I just started this podcast with actually comes from that book. It comes from one of the first tools. There's five tools outlined in this book. And what we're going to do in the next five podcasts is detail one tool in each podcast and share some action steps for you in your life. So the first tool is called the reversal of desire, and it addresses the, the self-sabotage that each person does when they're staying in their comfort zone. This includes things like virtuizing characteristics that go against what it is that you ultimately want. Like take, for example, if a person wanted to get to the next level of their career, but they didn't want to become, quote unquote, a sellout. And then every hard thing that is required to go to the next level, they then recreate a narrative or, or put a narrative on that thing that if they do that, then they would be selling out. When really the narrative is a convenient way to not have to do anything that exposes them maybe to their fears or something that they think is going to cause them pain. For example, if a person didn't want to be a sellout, but really all they were doing is avoiding maybe putting themselves in a situation where they feel like their life is in the control of somebody else's hands, then they might say things like, well, I can't do that because, and then they would refer back to a quality or characteristic that they have and not just that this is a characteristic, but it's actually a virtue of theirs. So what becomes a, um, a self-sabotaging behavior that keeps them from getting what they want is actually, a, and, and in fact creating virtues around it, is actually smokescreen for not wanting to put themselves in a position where they fear that they're going to experience some form of emotional or maybe psychological or even physical pain. And we do this kind of thing all the time. We're always self-sabotaging in order to stay in our comfort zone. Just like Joel mentioned in the sort of the mental exercise that he recommended at the beginning of this podcast, what are all the things you're doing in your life to be able to stay in a comfort zone? And there's it's okay to be in a comfort zone at times. That's all right. 
But when we construct an entire life around it and in fact get our minds to put in the work and effort of creating stories and narratives that actually put us in sort of this uh, the superior position in our mind because we won't take the actions that we need to take because those things might cause us pain. It's basically creating all of these stories that uh, validate the choices we're making that prevent us from going to the next level, prevent us from having to get out of our comfort zone. So the reversal of desire recognizes that we all have a desire to be comfortable. We all have a desire to, to avoid pain. But if one reverses that, then instead of seeing pain and seeing all of these uncomfortable emotions that come along with it, as opposed to seeing those as something to be avoided, we reverse our desire and actually start to desire pain itself. We start to desire uncomfortable emotions and uncomfortable situations, things that would that we would normally have created an entire life around avoiding, we actually now go towards them. Each of the tools in this book references what they call a higher force, higher power. It's really interesting. The book is a very practical book. There's mental and physical exercises you do in each of these tools, and they're also very woo-woo. They're tapping into what the authors have called a higher force or higher power. And the higher power in this particular tool that they have identified is the higher force of forward movement, moving with action toward a purpose. And there's almost a faith element to some of these things. As we go through these tools, again, try them in your life. I recommend getting the book and really digging into some of the material. Try them and understand that a lot of this is built on faith, that this is going to work, right? On the other side of desiring something like discomfort or pain... There's faith that if you push through this, through this technique or this tool, on the other side, you'll see success. You'll have things you want in life. The desires of your life will be fulfilled because pain is the stopping point. It's the thing that's in your way, getting what you want in life. And so this idea of reversing desire is to say, instead of avoiding pain, I realize that freedom and the things I want live on the other side of pain. So I'm going to now look at pain, whether it's emotional, physical, psychological, whatever, I'm going to look at pain and the painful things and the discomfort in my life as that gets me closer to my goals. That gets me closer to what I want because if I push through on the other side, there's freedom. There's a little uh, characterized uh, picture, a little uh, illustration is the word I'm looking for. (laughs) There's a little illustration in the book of a stick man who is on the other side of a wall and the wall is called pain. On the other side of the wall is infinite potential. So the stick figure, which of course represents each one of us, wants to stay in the comfort zone and not have to go through that wall of pain to get to their infinite potential. Now, this might not sound groundbreaking, right? The idea of getting out of your comfort zone is something that we've said on the podcast probably four billion times. And if you've listened to anybody else in personal growth or personal development, comfort zones are basically the enemy of progress. And everybody knows that. But I think what's so great about this idea of the reversal of desire is not to just simply bear it, right? Not just go, okay, I got to get through pain to get to what I want on the other side. It's this idea of building a relationship with pain. It's an idea of seeing it as something not simply to be, you know, sort of dealt with or endured, but almost like a friend. It's the, it's the, cookie crumb trail that leads you to your potential, to all the things you want. Joel just mentioned that in some part, because this book is written with things like higher forces in mind, like the higher force of forward motion with the reversal of desire, that there's a little bit of faith that needs to be taken into account. But I don't think that the faith is in whether or not the tool works, because we see evidence of that all the time. Everybody that we know that has gotten to a place where they understand their potential, maybe to a place where they are tapped into this idea of infinite potential. They are people who embrace pain. There are people who embrace their fears. They embrace all of the things that force them out of their comfort zones. So clearly they make an an arrangement with pain. They make a relationship with it that says, you're actually a friend. You're a person who is a guide. You're a Sherpa that leads me up the mountain. And so the idea of getting out of your comfort zone is one piece of it. 
this is a formula for how to do that consistently and to do so without feeling the sense of resistance every single time it, it approaches you. When you have an entire life that you've built around avoiding uncomfortable things, it is really insidious at how your environment is basically, it, it's, it's sabotaging you all the time. And then the stories and narratives that you build to maintain that environment of comfort is the next piece of the self-sabotaging. Virtuizing the story that keeps you in your comfort zone is another level of self-sabotaging. So the only way to get out of this dynamic of constant and perpetual self-sabotage is to embody this idea of forming a relationship with pain, something that is actually friendly, something that sees pain as your best friend. Now, that's hard to do as people. We are constantly seeking homeostasis. We don't like the idea of pain. But the faith that needs to go into it isn't a faith that the tool works. Like we look at people whose bodies are beautifully sculpted through a lot of pain at the gym or a lot of pain of doing resistance training. And so we know this is a this this is something that's kind of a no-brainer. It's a it's a formula or a principle of life that always works. But the faith that we have to have is personal. It's when we're in a situation where we are out of our comfort zone and we start to feel that pain, that initial pain, that's when we have to have faith that this universal principle also applies to us. Because one of the challenges that we experience as people is that we always have exception thinking. Somehow we'll figure out how to get to our goals without having to get out of our comfort zone. Sometimes we, somehow we'll figure it all out by creating a complex or sophisticated enough narrative that gets us there while not having to go through a wall of pain. And we also have exception thinking the other direction, which is, well, if I'm feeling pain, it's actually bad for me. It might be good for everybody else, but not for me. If I'm feeling pain, that that means I'm actually doing the wrong thing. So it's the faith that the universal principle that works for everybody else will also work for us. And on top of it, it's it's recognizing that the pain that we feel that everything inside of us goes, oh, this must mean a bad thing. We recognize that on the other side of it is our ability to tap into and access who we were meant to be. And so the faith is actually a faith in oneself that going through this adversity and going through all of these challenges and going through all of these emotions that feel so sometimes just, they just feel untenable. Recognizing that we have what it takes we have enough faith in ourselves to, to move through this and get to the other place so we can meet the version of us that is tapped into infinite potential. So I want to go over the actual exercise itself, the tool itself, disembodied from the book. So you, you might need to read some to get context, but at least this is a nugget for you to take away. You'll know you need the tool when you are avoiding an action that you need to take. There's a couple cues that they recommend. The first cue comes when you have to do something uncomfortable and you feel fear or resistant. The second cue occurs when you think about doing something painful or difficult. So when those come up, the reversal of desire tool can be used as technology to move yourself forward. So here's the actual tool the authors recommend. This is directly from the book. See the pain appear in front of you as a cloud. So this is a mental imagery technique. You're imagining seeing the pain appear in front of you as a cloud, scream silently at the cloud, bring it on. Feel an intense desire for the pain to move you into the cloud. Scream silently, I love pain as you keep moving forward. Go so deeply into the pain, you're at one with it. You will feel the cloud spit you out and close behind you. Say inwardly with conviction, pain sets me free. As you leave the cloud, feel yourself propelled forward into a realm of pure light. So basically the three steps are, bring it on, you say to pain. I love pain. Pain sets me free. Bring it on. I love pain. Pain sets me free. That's almost like a mantra. And then this exercise, imagining this situation from that framework moves you into the pain to get to the other side of it. Now, I know everybody has exception thinking these days. <laughs> Whenever whenever I say anything anywhere, I've noticed that there's always one person who has to say, yeah, except 
blah, 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 <laughs> dot, dot, dot. Life's footnotes. <laughs> Life's footnotes. So if you're a person who's listening to this and going, yeah, but not all pain is good, that is accurate. Sometimes some pain is in t- intended to send signals to your brain that says this is a situation you don't want to be in and get out of it. But that's not the kind of pain we're talking about. We're not talking about pain that you uh, needlessly put on upon yourself. We're not talking about the kind of pain that people use as a relief valve for other types of pain. We're not talking about feeling pain because of uh, masochism. If you're a masochist, you're allowed to be, but that's not the kind of pain we're talking about. Well, and quite frankly, pain is used to feel more comfortable in those situations. Exactly, right? We're not talking about the, the kind of pain that actually keeps you in a comfort zone. We're talking about the pain that you are avoiding because you think that you can't handle it, because you fear that if you were to enter that form of pain, it would be too much for you and it would overwhelm you. It's the kind of pain that actually forges us with fire. It's not the kind of pain that makes us small or diminishes us. It's not staying in bad situations. It's not allowing yourself to be hurt over and over again. It's not saying no pain, no gain, and then putting yourself in a a situation where it actually does harm. Obviously, health is the guiding star here. And infinite potential, reaching a place of infinite potential is your guiding star. So if you are experiencing pain to no end, then that's not what we're talking about. That's not you getting out of the uh, comfort zone. That's you having incorporated pain into your comfort zone. The way you'll know that you're doing this right is you'll have two emergence. The first one is that this kind of pain gets alchemized into power. You will feel empowerment as you do it. You won't feel titillated. You won't feel just an extreme emotion. You won't feel just simply a sense of relief valve. You'll actually feel more self-direction. You'll feel self-esteem. You will feel a sense of freedom. Right? It's the kind of pain that we avoid because it forces us to become something different than what we are. And we're a little too attached to the current iteration of ourselves to be able to find the iteration of ourselves that lives on the other side of this. So this is not pain for pain's sake. This is pain to alchemize and turn into power. So that's the first one. If you start to feel a sense of power, if you're feeling empowered, if you feel freedom or control over your life, then that's, that's you doing it right. If you're feeling the opposite of those things, then that's you having incorporated a concept of pain into your comfort zone and you're doing it wrong. The second thing that's an emergent is a feeling of courage. This allows you to build your courage. Oftentimes, well, I would say that in the modern world, we don't get a lot of opportunities to create a feeling of courage. Well, we do, but we're also told to go easy on ourselves. We're told to, if it's too hard, rest, If it's too much, don't, you know, don't push yourself. If that requires some self-discipline, well, then that might not be something that you need. You know, listen to your body, listen to your emotions, and honor them above all things. That is okay, okay advice, not fantastic advice, but that is okay advice sometimes. But if that becomes how you live your life, then you will not face who you are in a place of infinite potential. Right, Because you'll have gone too easy on the current iteration of yourself. You will not have been able to forge yourself into the person that you can become. One of the things that's required is courage. The best version of yourself has courage in spades because it has already gone through so many different situations of adversity and proven to itself that it's able to get through all of that and survive on the other side. That's how self-esteem is created. So self-esteem rides on the back of courage and courage rides on the back of facing pain expectantly and facing pain expectantly rides on the back of being able to see all the ways in which you are convincing yourself not to do what you need to do. So in order to get to that place, you have to have gone through all of these different vehicles, including the vehicle of courage. So one of the great emergence that comes from this entire system is that you have a generalized sense of courage. Now, courage is a muscle just like anything else, but it's also habituated. You do get to a place eventually where courage becomes something like kindness, right? If you're a person who had to work on kindness, maybe you're really self-centered and you just think about yourself all the time. 
And you've had to work on thinking about other people first. You've had to think about the idea of seeing things in terms of other people's best interest, not just your own. Eventually, if you work on the muscle of kindness, it becomes a way of being, a way of engagement and interaction. The same thing applies with courage. Eventually, you get to a place where you don't have to bolster everything up every time you're in a situation that requires some courage. It becomes something that's just sort of a lens that you see life through. And you realize that you've gone through so many different situations that you've proven to yourself that you can get through. This one's probably just as survivable as all the other ones. And you get to a place where you kind of want to test your mettle. Courage is something you you experience not when you don't feel fear. Courage is something you experience when you're feeling fear. It's the ability to get past it. It's ability to rise through and cut through all of that and be willing to face all of that expectantly. And so courage becomes something that sort of allows you to engage with all this stuff in life that normally would have kept you down. And then once you're seeing life through this lens of courage, you do get to a place where you wonder if anything can take you out. And now it becomes more of a game, right? Courage helps you gamify life and see things more through the lens of, yeah, I think I can do that. You stop doubting yourself. All of the rewards that come on the other side of being willing to reverse this desire, all of them are so, I mean, they're so important. And this is why people in personal development are constantly going on and on about it. It's because the person that you will meet on the other side of all of this really is free. This is a version of yourself that has so much, it's not just potential, it has so much realized potential that there really, there there couldn't be a better tool to start with. So I want to draw some attention to the woo-woo elements of what we're talking about here too. And some of this is going to have personal opinion and personal experience woven into it. And I understand that. So you have to take this for what it is in your life. I have noticed in my life, there are energies at play that I'm almost like my myself as a vessel, as an attunement instrument, is almost like a radio tuning to a radio signal. And these energies at play in the world, I can attune myself to. You've probably had the experience, maybe even recently, of feeling real down and negative, maybe not even knowing why, where events in the world, fears, trauma, anxieties, the media messages, the things you're seeing and hearing you feel agitated maybe some days and you feel upset and anxious. Well, you're attuned to a certain energy field of anxiety, fear, stress, and this can feel very real. It can feel very tangible. Even if you don't have anything specific that might be causing that, you're, you're almost picking it up from the world at large, from society, the media, things of that nature. And you've probably taken steps in your life to ensure you are managing your mental health and your emotional health so you don't feel those ways. And there's, it's something going on beyond just what's happening in your life. Like you're not on you know, the, the Serengeti being chased by a lion hundreds of thousands of years ago, and yet your body and your emotional response might feel that way. It might trigger those responses, even though that's not literally happening. You are tapped into, attuned into an energy of sorts, and maybe it's not a good energy. And I think what we're talking about here is attuning yourself to more empowering energies that are in the world. So it's a little abstract, but I really believe this is what's happening. And it might take a little bit of skill to get there. You do this exercise, the book recommends, you go through the motions, you do the mental imagery, you try to put yourself in the emotional state, you, you scream at pain and say, bring it on, and maybe you don't feel the results or see the results in your life. Well, you're still learning the skill of attuning yourself to these energies that are more abstract. So stick with it. If you don't see results directly, stick with the exercises because I believe that if you do them enough, you will attune yourself to those energies. Just like if you listen to society or media enough, they eventually attune you to their energies and you almost can't escape it. So it's on a long timeline. This might take some discipline, practice, and skill building to get there. Yeah, these higher forces in the book I don't think that you have to be too into the woo to kind of understand where they're coming from. Like, I, I, everybody hates it when you use the phrase woo woo. <laughs> they hate it when we do it. Uh, the, the NFs are like, don't discredit the things we're into. And the NTs are like, oh, here it comes. For me, I have, it's one of those things where 
I don't have to believe it to have observed that it just works. I just, I just know that it, it it is how it works because I have observed it so many different times. And regardless of whether or not you buy into this metaphysical description of higher forces or at some point we'll also talk about the concept of source, regardless of whether or not you buy into them as truisms of the universe, there does seem to be principles in here that are definitely helpful, like the idea of forward motion. Like, th- basically, that's something that all of us can recognize is highly conducive to our mental and emotional health and our physical health. When we are exercising, when we're moving forward, when we're making gains in our life, when there are things that are happening and we're in motion, that just feels better, right? It's it's kind of a, it's kind of a similar principle that I think of that Disney employed in their in their rides at Disneyland and Disney World. They move you through scenes, and it's because when you're moving forward, it's like a different experience than just be, you know being passively entertained with the screen in front of you. When you're watching TV, that's one thing, but when you're moving through a ride, I don't know, it just feels so much more rich. So it does seem to be a, a universal principle, at least as far as humans are concerned. That when we're moving through space, moving forward, that just feels better. So it doesn't have to tap into like a woo-woo place, even though it can if you want it to. And I don't mean woo-woo in a bad way (laughs) to those of you that are into that kind of thing. But it does seem like there are reasons why we have these explanations in lots of different paradigms and perspectives and, and explanations of how everything works. Because these might be sort of pylons of just how we have evolved to engage in, you know, in the life, the universe and everything. I think one thing that the book really highlights, which I think is important, and this is something that you say all the time, Joel, that learning isn't just understanding. Learning is behavior change. It's an embodied experience. Real learning is embodied. It's integrated into who you are and it's integrated into your life. So once again, this idea of getting out of your comfort zone is not groundbreaking, but actually getting out of your comfort zone is groundbreaking, the actual action of doing it. So as Joel mentioned, they recommend in your mind doing these exercises of telling yourself that you love pain, bring it on. Pain is on the other side of pain is freedom, like actually integrating this message, not just understanding you've got to get out of your comfort zone. But turning the unconscious conscious, looking around at your life and the landscape and the feng shui of everything you've set up in your world, how much of what you set up in your world is designed to keep you comfortable? How much is designed to allow you to avoid interacting with people you don't know? How much is designed to keep you from having to make phone calls that are uncomfortable or having to engage in conversations that you can't control the outcome of? How much is set up to make sure that you don't have to deal with people you don't want to deal with or make, you know, make a commute you don't want to make or whatever it is, right? How much, how many of the things you want in life live on the other side of this? Start making the, the unconscious conscious. Start looking at everything in your world that you've built to keep you in that cocoon, One thing that I have observed and noticed, and I don't know if this is everybody or this is just something that I've seen, but in younger generations, I've noticed that people are very avoidant of even greeting somebody that they haven't engaged with first. Like we've noticed this with um, like sitting in hot tubs. If there's a person our age or older, they'll just come join us in the hot tub if it's like a public hot tub. But other like younger generations will hold back and wait until we leave. It's a general idea of not wanting to engage with somebody that you haven't vetted first. And I think it's because in the modern world, we're able to vet everybody digitally. Like we're able to kind of feel them out digitally first, and then we go find them. This you see in dating apps, you see this in basic general interactions and engagements with people. And I think it's a metaphor. I think this holding back and not engaging with things that are unfamiliar or people who are unfamiliar is a metaphor for how we've sort of set up our entire life. We want to vet it first. We want to feel it out in the comfort of a digital experience before we throw ourselves into it. So if you have created an environment 
where you're screening everything from the comfort of your chair, from the comfort of your home, from the comfort of your iPhone or your smartphone or whatever. Like if you are, if you are, I should have said, <laughs> I should have said smartphone and not iPhone because there's lots of Android users out there. But if you are basically leaning back until you feel comfortable enough to lean forward, then you have definitely created a world of staying in your comfort zone in your cocoon. So how do you break out of it? Well, you go take actions and do things that are not digitally vetted first. You go do behaviors and jump into scenarios where you aren't sure what the outcome is going to be and it might get real bad. These are the moments where you say, and by real bad, I mean awkward. I don't mean bad like you'll die. I mean bad like, ugh, that didn't feel good. I didn't like that. Throw yourself in scenarios where that is inevitable. Get used to that kind of pain because that's simply the pain of discomfort. It's not the pain of something that's actually going to come get you, right? That's, there's no actual survival involved in there. Their only survival is to your ego, so put yourself in situations where you are now greeting strangers on the street. Well, of course, right now we're, we're a little kept from doing that kind of thing as much. <laughs> but greet people that you don't know. Make eye contact. Say hi. Go in. Lean in to situations that you cannot predict the outcome on. And it's that kind of pain that they're talking about. Do things that you haven't vetted from the comfort of whatever you're using right now to keep yourself comfortable. And on the other side of that is you manifesting your infinite potential. I can't tell you how many times we've done a live meetup or an event in the last few years here at Personality Hacker where a very introverted person came up to me during that meetup and said something to the effect of, I never do this. I never go out and meet people like this very much or I very rarely do, or I never do. And thanks for hosting this. This is way out of my comfort zone. Usually I'll encourage the person like, that's great. That's awesome you're doing that. And usually, I'm trying to think if there's been any example when they have been disappointed they did that or had a frown on their face. I think in 100% of the times, they had a huge smile on their face. They got connected to a community of like minds. They came out not knowing how it was going to go. In fact, some have even admitted to me that they they kind of checked it out around the corner at the coffee shop we were having the meetup at just to see what it would like be like. And they were giving themselves permission to flee if they wanted to. And they still pushed through and came up and introduced themselves to each person there. And it was a great experience for them. And everyone had smiles on their faces. They were really glad they did that. Being out of their comfort zone was a reward for them. And they got a lot out of it. So if you're that type of person too, you know, you're maybe you're a little shy and stuff. I think that's still this kind of tool can help with all of these things in your life, depending on what they are. Because we all have different things we're uncomfortable about. Like I might be super outgoing and I might be able to go up to people on the street and say hi, uh, you know, outwardly. There's other things I have discomfort around and I have to find leverage on myself and mental technologies and tools to align myself with this higher force of forward movement, forward momentum in order to see the results I want to see. You and I met because I did this, actually. Uh, we were at a neurolinguistic programming conference 10 years ago now. And the instructor said, be not you. That's one of the best ways to understand the plasticity of your mind is to be not you. Get out of your comfort zone and do something that you wouldn't do. And I was not the kind of person that would pursue somebody, especially at a conference. And I saw you across the room and I was like, I'm going to go hit on that guy. <laughs> and I did. And it turned out really well. I mean, it could have turned out poorly, but that's the gamble, right? And our relationship has absolutely unlocked so much more of my infinite potential. So there's that idea, you know, we talked about at the beginning, this idea of selling out and the virtues we create around the narratives or stories we give ourselves that let us off the hook. And one of the best things you can do is be not you. If you're afraid you're going to sell out and you find yourself hitting a ceiling all the time in your career... Maybe you need to be a sellout. What does that mean? Most of the time, we don't completely do things against, not most of the time, generally we don't do anything that's truly against our values, deep, deep, deep core values. But most of the time when we say things like, I'm not going to be a sellout, is it's not our values that are, are the thing that we're trying to avoid offending. It's our ego that we're trying to avoid offending. <laughs> so... 
be the sellout and then calibrate as you go, right? Put yourself in situations that would be quote unquote not you and then learn who that person deep down inside, that person of value truly is or what your values actually are and calibrate as you go. We're not saying go against things that are important to you, but we are say, saying go against the things that have decided that comfort is of the utmost importance because I guarantee people who have comfort as their guiding star are absolutely compromising their values. They're just doing it in behalf of comfort. So be willing to get out of your comfort zone. See pain as your best friend. Form a new relationship with it and figure out who that person of infinite potential is on the other side. The tool is called The Reversal of Desire. It comes from the book, The Tools, by Phil Stutz and Barry Michaels. We'll have a link in the show notes below this show to that book. I recommend getting it. It's been a powerful book in my life. I think it'll work well for you too. And we're going to continue talking about these tools in a series of podcasts, giving you some insight and maybe some encouragement for each one of these to use in your life. Almost the cliff notes, book review side of things, and then get the book and really dig into some of that. What do you think? What's coming up for you as you listen along, as you're part of this conversation? Come over to personalityhacker.com directly below this show. Ask a question, leave a comment. More importantly, share your story. Maybe you have this book. Maybe you've identified this idea of reversal of desire, going toward pain and realizing the freedom on the other side of pain in your life. We want to hear what that's been like for you. What, what stops you from doing that too? Come over to Personality Hacker and make your voice heard. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe to us on iTunes and various Android platforms. If you leave a rating and review for us on iTunes, that helps us out a lot. We have a book. It's called Personality Hacker. It's available at all major book retailers. And if you leave a rating and review for us on Amazon or on, uh, what is it called? Uh, Goodreads. Goodreads. <laughs> I only say it every time. That also helps us out a lot. And of course... We subsidize the podcast. We never have ads, but we do subsidize the podcast with our programs that you can find at personalityhacker.com. If you're interested in investing in yourself and taking it to the next level, go check out our catalog of programs at Personality Hacker. There may be a personal growth program that's tailored just to your personality type and to you. So go check it out. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And we'll talk with you on the next Personality Hacker podcast. Personality Hacker.